Yeah, just so you guys know as well, uh, we have some, some, some lovely assistants here that were, were kind enough to, to help me out. So they'll be running around and, and helping to answer questions when, when inevitably things go wrong, despite the fact that, that we've prepared and it should just be a few simple commands. Ping should work against against this address. <sighs> yeah, it's 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 non USB keyable. We kind of put this together. I kind of no, I mean, but just in terms of transferring stuff around, was that your? It's like there is. You know, we've like we have a proxy set up, and it's going to configure to do all the all the package installs via proxy, and kind of. Yeah, there's some there's some risk associated with this. I'm okay with that. Huh? Another thing is is some people could try to connect through the other network. Oh no, no, never mind, never mind. That's not going to work. Yeah. You know, I, I, I could just throw the vagrant box on a on a US. Great, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna kick this thing off. So Welcome everyone to my to my grand experiment. And I think that when you submit to talk at conferences, I'm pretty sure that they'll always accept hands-on labs because you have to be crazy to actually try to get a large group of people in the same room and make something work. Um, we've we've kind of tried to to take some various provisions down here with with bringing our own our own. Um, devices and router and, and, and creating our own network to try to alleviate some concerns. Um, but I think we, we, we tried to pick the way to do this that, that wouldn't take forever, but also felt like it would probably work. So I know that especially in terms of everyone fighting for, for network through our router, um, it'll, it'll be interesting. We might have to retry some things if, if, if we have some spurious failures. But fortunately, Puppet knows how to, how to deal with, with partial failure states. So we can just keep on running it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and, and kind of walk everyone through some instructions. And I know I'm, I'm just about to go through all that stuff. And I know that, that so it was listed as a requirement that people should have VirtualBox and Vagrant installed before they're here. And I'm just curious, show of hands, who read that and was like, man, you guys rock. I didn't even have to do all this setup. Well, I've, I've, I've brought my own, so I'm going to walk through um, some of the steps for for things that I actually have. Um, and, and you know, Cody, if you can log on to that server, maybe trying to put like the base box, oh, you can't? Yeah. Trying to put the, uh, like the base box on a USB might not be the worst thing, if that's what's taking up bandwidth. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of walk through the steps. Just so that everyone knows, I've, I, I kind of put something together and I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why it's not showing up in my, in my lovely web server, but the server up here with, with a lot of the uh, prereqs on it is, can be found once you've connected to our network, which is puppet underscore OpenStack, same password. And there's a readme up here, uh, which, which has everything you should need, including the, the things that need to be downloaded. Um, I'm going to walk through these things, but just so that everyone knows, there, there is a readme because, of course, people are going to be at different stages as I go through the presentation. So everything is in this readme, which is on the web server, which people are, are free to download, and, and, and it should be fairly easy to download. So I'm going to go ahead and, and start walking through first. Some of the steps for this. And we're going to kind of do this in, in two parts. We're going to go through the let's actually get this thing working. 
And then once people have this thing working, we're going to dissect um, especially a lot of the, of the puppet part of this so that people can get a better understanding for what's going on under the covers. So the first thing is that um, we've, we've brought our own network. Uh, the password is actually the same as the SSID for the network. And we're bridging to the outside world from here. Um, but please respect that, that we're bridging you know, through a single patch cable. So, so please respect our pipes. Um, there's going to be a, 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 a couple dependencies. And it looks like most people have either gotten here early and, and gotten the, the virtual box, which is the heaviest of, of, of the dependencies on. Uh, we're also going to be using Vagrant, which is a fairly light dependency. Uh, if you look up on our web server, you'll see all these things. Maybe the, the, the biggest bandwidth constraint for getting started is, is going to be the, the, the base image that we're going to be using to install OpenStack on. Um, and we also have the actual Puppet modules and, and all the content on the server as well. So I can, I can update this, because we didn't know if we were going to have a predictable IP address. But everything that you need is up here. Um, even for people getting started, at least it's, it, it kind of assumes Mac, and, and sorry, I had to kind of assume something. Um, but of course, the only things that are Mac specific up here are the actual uh, VirtualBox DMG for installing VirtualBox and also the Vagrant DMG. Um, everything else is not specific to any platform, right? So the, so the precise 64 um, base box or, or base image is doesn't matter what platform you're actually on. And also, there's a tarball that contains all of the Puppet-related things that, of course, doesn't matter what, what platform you're on. So if we're looking at the server here, just looking at, at 10.0.1.2 in the, in the share directory, you can see all the things that you need in order to get started. Uh, the biggest of those is actually this precise base box, and I know that, that one, of my, one of my fantastic assistants is actually going to be putting that on a USB key just in case people are having bandwidth issues for, for getting that, that box down, because I think that is definitely the biggest of all the requirements and possibly why you gentlemen in the, in the front row were trying to hand me a USB key a second ago. Um, so that should just be a few minutes. Also, it's, it's actually on here as well. Can I see? So I'm going to give people a, a little bit of time here. Are, are people currently downloading? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. What's the, how does, what's the, the, the bandwidth and, and latency feel like right now? Slow. Oh, good. Oh, 25 minutes on, on, on which artifact? Uh, on the base box? Um, let's go ahead and if, let's go ahead and just put that on, on, a, on, a, on a USB key and maybe just pass that around. It's a plain box. There's really nothing special. Like, if it's a box, if that box already has Puppet installed with, with the reasonable version, I know that that specific base box for folks that use it was recently updated. Um, both the old version and the new version work just fine. Okay, because I was using providers for the virtual box, so I was wondering if that is So, for the Fusion providers, so, so the question was that for people who are using the Fusion provider of Vagrant as opposed to the virtual box provider, will it work? The issue you're going to run into is the Vagrant file actually is using the old format and hasn't been updated. Cody right there has a version of that Vagrant file that works on Fusion. So the only thing, if you're using the actual Vagrant provider for Fusion, is that the uh, Vagrant file itself hasn't been updated to the new format and it has VirtualBox specific configuration in the Vagrant file. Um, I know that, that Cody does have a file that works, so using Fusion should be possible. You, you'll just have to update the Vagrant file. Cody's done it before. It's, it's a little bit risky, but for the sake of bandwidth, it's, it's maybe better to have as many people as possible not re-downloading things. <laughs> uh, 
it's going to be easier. You, it, if we're using Vagrant on this stuff, it's going to be just a couple commands. You know, trying to catch up manually is potentially going to be different because there's quite a lot of recreate. Um, I'll, I'll walk through and, and kind of dissect everything. It's also, guys, guys, it's, it's here. It's, it's on here. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna grab that they're they're gonna grab it off there and, and pass the the vagrant for fusion costs money. <laughs> um. The base box should be in the in the what is it dot vagrant slash box directory? Is that right? Can you help out? Oh, look and just downloads. And I, and I think for now, if, if, if people are, are trying to get the base box, I think we're going to switch that up to be um, a, a USB solution and help pass it around just to save on bandwidth, because it looks like it's crawling slow and, and maybe even unrealistic that people's downloads are going to finish. Yeah, it should just be vagrant box add. You have to do vagrant box add the name, and then the location of the box add. Or, um, you're, you guys are getting ahead. Um, the, I mean, the proxy just needs to be this address and then uh, colon 3128, but that stuff's going to be in the public config, so you guys are, you guys are, are at, at, at different paces. Um, but, but we've already hard-coded all, all the proxy stuff, so it should just work. And, and you'll know when you run vagrant up OpenStack underscore controller that if you haven't set up the proxy correctly, then, then things are just going to blow up. Um, Sorry? Everything's going through a proxy. So everything, it's, it, everything's going through an app proxy. I don't think there's any direct, the only like HTTP call would be um, to get the, the base image, which is on the Apache server, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Your, oh, for, for the actual, no, I don't, no, I think that the default right now is not, is not HTTPS for the actual a API endpoints. I know that, that, that people are doing it, but I don't have, yeah, I don't have my head wrapped around it right now. I know that, that people are definitely using the HTTPS endpoints with the puppet modules, but I'm not sure what the exact configuration is for that. So, so I wouldn't really worry too much about the, about the precise 64 box requirement now. We're going to be putting that on USB. We'll just need that when we're actually trying to fire things up. Um, so, so once people have actually downloaded our zip tarball, which is actually all the Puppet content, you'll need to unzip that. And, and, and actually from within this directory is, is, is where we're going to be running the lab. And again, these, these things are just on the web server. Oh, good, people are adding boxes. And then once people have the boxes, which will maybe be a second, because I know, if, are, are, are people ch still trying to download the, the base box and with, with mixed amounts of, of success? If you already have an existing base box called Precise 64, you're fine. Well, are you trying to add a box when you already have a box? Oh, 
Oh, is that or is is the bandwidth? Yeah. No, we're not. Don't don't mess with that right now. Yeah, once 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 people are up and, and actually like like once you actually have the content and the, and the TGZ, it's actually two commands. And it, and if some people are ready, you know, it's definitely going to be staggered. But if people are ready to go now with the public content, you just need to run Vagrant up OpenStack controller and then Vagrant up Compute One. Uh, you'll need to run these um, serially. Vagrant doesn't support. Um, so so you'll have to first run Vagrant up OpenStack underscore controller and then Vagrant up Compute One. Yeah, and, and, and definitely for people that are ready, thank you so much that we should start doing that now because I know that the main bottleneck is going to be the, uh, the, the package installs through our proxy running. The readme file, sorry, for some reason you, you can't see it on, on the server. It's just a misconfiguration, but it's just, it's just right there. And feel free to ask questions. I actually put this... This read me together pretty quickly last night, but it should have everything you need. The only thing that I'd warn people is that that this command here, once we have OpenStack operational, um, hold off because this will start trying to download the serious image from the internet, which will like like we actually have that available on the Apache server, so we don't have to go out to the internet. This is the one thing that's not in the Squid Proxy. It's just a misconfiguration. What's the URL for the readme? Uh, it's it's 10.0.1.2 slash share slash readme. And that's assuming that you guys are connected to the puppet underscore OpenStack network that, that we've brought. Sorry? It's just gonna run for a while. It'll just, I mean, you're just running it from the, from the terminal, so it's just gonna exit, preferably with zero. Sorry? Yeah, it, it'll, it'll, it, it sometimes take, takes a few minutes to set up the network interfaces. It's actually, it's actually creating four sets of, of uh, virtual interfaces on those devices. No, the box image is, oh yeah, I, I would stop that, or that's gonna, th th that's gonna clog the bandwidth. No, you just need to run this command, vagrant box add. You need to specify the name of the box, which needs to be precise for, and then specify the actual file path to the box. So, and, 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 and the box is, is, we were previously supplying on the Apache server that we're running, but I know that because of the, of the size of it, we're, we're quickly throwing it on some, on some USB keys and, and, and passing that box around. Sorry? Uh, I mean, whatever, 193, 187, whatever. I'm not, I'm not too fussed about, about specific versions of Ruby for this, so. Good, you guys have? Just out of curiosity, has someone taken the, the base box from the USB key and, and added it to Vagrant successfully? No, not yet. Not yet? Okay. But, it, but it's in progress? Good, so it looks possible. And again, you know, when, once you have all the artifacts, it's really just this, this Vagrant box add, It'll be Vagrant up OpenStack controller and Vagrant up Compute One. How are you guys running? Yeah, no, this is good. That's Puppet. You're, you're, you're doing Puppet stuff now. So pre.64 is, is, is the file that I have that basically sets up the app proxy, like that's one of the modifications 
that sets up the app proxy before we run app get update because we're actually running app get update in line from the vagrant file. You shouldn't have to modify the proxy anyway. <laughs> like all that stuff's hard coded. Like 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 the version that we distributed from the web server has all the proxy settings hard coded. So, yeah, so just to, just to repeat what, what Cody said, there's, there's a couple USB keys with a lot of the initial dependencies um, going around, and, and just, just keep on passing those around, and they have uh, the puppet content, the, the actual image that we're going to be using for the virtual machines that we're going to spin up theoretically, and then we're going to get to, uh, to the interesting part. What's that? I mean, the, 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 the real connection is between everyone's laptop and that, and, and our tiny little router. So the README is available. That's just share slash README. So the README is available on the on, on, on the web server that we're hosting. So it's just 10.0.1.2 slash share slash README. Has the instructions. And and pretty soon a lot of what people are going to be doing is just waiting. Oh, this is the USB key line. Oh, good. Yeah, I think they're very, they're very slowly just making their way out through the audience. Thanks, guys. Thanks for pulling that one. So I think that, that it, if people are, are, are looking at the documentation, don't, don't worry about, about the statement that, that it makes about searching for proxy stuff. Um, all the proxy stuff set up. So in the README, you can ignore that step. Sorry about that. It's it's there, there's a typo in the file name and like, but it, but you don't have to do that. All the proxy stuff has been hard coded. All you should have to do is just the vagrant up and the. Oh really? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I mean, there's probably two questions. One is, is it actually getting hits in the proxy? And the second is, I mean, I mean, I, mean, I guess there's some reality that we're just saturating the hell out of, out of, like the connection between here and that tiny little router is just not going to work. <laughs> Snap. Do you figure at least it could do like rolls of like ten at a time? It should only take a couple minutes to get from. Yeah. Big. We got tons of time. We've got so much time still. It's all, it's all, it's all math, right? It's it's time, laughs, bandwidth. <laughs> the what?
No, that, that stuff's done. You don't have to change anything. Yeah, it's just taking forever to install packages because the freaking network is totally saturated. And and I would say too, for the sake of the network, if. If people are actually actively trying to trying to download the the precise 64 base box, just please stop. <laughs> please stop. It's just too big. It, it was it was probably a mistake for not for us not to USB, and we're 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 in the process of fixing it. So if you're trying to download the precise 64 base box, just stop. So we can slowly start to to have people connect and. and We talked about various ways we could have done it. Those are the folks that who's who's waiting for. For USB sticks? Okay. Oh, especially people in the back. Yeah, okay, so there's two in the back. If you have USB sticks, come forward, like leave the file. <laughs> oh, I like this. I think, um, 
I think we're getting pretty close to a reality check here. <laughs> and that is that, that, you know, despite all the wonderful effort that people are putting forth for, for trying to get some of the initial requirements down, uh, together, that's actually part one. And I think the reality is that it's just our, I would guess it's just the poor little disk on our, on our single server just can't possibly process all, all the, so many file requests, squid proxy or not. Um, it's even people that are at the next step. Either people are still trying to download those giant images, but like I've, I've yet to see a single person actually install a package. And, and those have been going for at least five minutes. Has, has anyone actually seen a puppet indicator that they actually did successfully install a package with a proxy? How, ma how many? But I think that... Um, Wait, you can download what in 10 seconds? Oh, really? Can you see the disk, the disk, what the disk I.O. looks like? What do you think? Now is when the fun begins. <laughs> no, that's the big one. Is I mean, I mean, well, no, no, no. Uh, the, actually, the MySQL package is the big one. That's that's fly. Yeah. All right. Some so there are our first round of people are actually installing OpenStack now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks like. It looks like I guess people have have now given up on their on their on trying to download all the stuff that we're distributing via USB. Amazing. I think as soon as one person's done, we're we're out. <laughs> so I'm gonna let. No, I, I don't have the right one on here. They're all just on there. So, so if m m maybe you could spread this back to the box. If they just go to this server, 10.0.1.2, this is this this has the instructions for the kind of things that need to be downloaded, what content they need to do, they need to un untar this, and then this should be the vagrant box add command. That's good. All right. Yeah, it's just a, the controller has a ton of packages. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, this is what took forever is the installation of the MySQL server package. Well, I mean, this is that's the biggest package to install is the MySQL server. It has tons of binaries. Yeah, yeah well, that's just the update update. You have to get the package installs, which is, which is what's going to be really causing it. It's going to be disk latency. It's, in, it's installing OpenStack. I'm having a fun. I'm having a blast. So, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna trudge on, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what's going on because I think that everyone, for the most part, knows what needs to be done. Some people are gonna finish. Most of you probably aren't, but feel free to download the README. Um, kind of sorry about this instruction, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the thing that we're working on. I wonder if they're talking about me. What's that all about? Um, maybe. So I'm going to move on to starting to talk a little bit about what's going on. And I think we're pretty much past where everyone feels like they have their requirements. And, and anyone who's going to try has what they need at this point to get started. 
So I'm going to talk a little about kind of kind of what's going on. I I, I want to start with the kind of a of an explanation of, of what we're attempting here, which which may or may not be crazy. Um, it's just to have your laptop. Uh, we're going to start with just installing. I mean, for for some people, Fusion. Uh, even though what I'm using here is is VirtualBox, so that we can use Vagrant. And and I'm not sure who has some familiarity with Vagrant or or, or uses Vagrant. Um, it's a pretty nifty tool. I think that. If we start to look in the OpenStack landscape and we start to look at things like triple O plus heat are, are, are kind of do the same thing as what Vagrant does now. Um, I, I know a lot of, there have been a lot of sessions about you know, triple O for actually being able to build kind of, uh, or, and, and heat for specifications of, of actually the multiple machines that you would want to build as a part of something. And in Vagrant, we're defining two virtual machines, which is why we're actually running Vagrant up for the controller, Vagrant up for the compute node. So it's Vagrant that's responsible for specifying how we're gonna actually use that precise 64 base box in order to create those two virtual machines, which will be the common roles for deploying a, a multi-node OpenStack instance. And the last part of that, that, that as a part of the Vagrant up command, we're also gonna be running Puppet, which will convert those virtual machines from the base precise 64 image that we've been distributing via USB key when the Apache server fell over, um, and, and actually convert those into the roles of one OpenStack controller and one OpenStack compute node. So I want to talk a little bit about, about some of the technology bits, um, and, and, and then maybe I'll make it through some of these and I'll, 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 we'll do a status update to see where people are. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is Vagrant, and, and Vagrant's really being driven by this Vagrant file. So all of these things you can find inside of the OpenStack um, DevM folder. And that's the folder. So for example, for the Vagrant file, I just wanted to walk through, and, and the basis behind this is that it's a, it's a somewhat simplified DSL for specifying how to create virtual machines, and, and more specifically, how to then run Puppet on those virtual machines to turn them into some machine with some actual role. So looking at, at my Vagrant file, which I'm going to bump up the font on just a little bit, I, I kind of have, have gone maybe a little bit crazy with, with you know, embedding Ruby code in this stuff. But the main point of it is that here you can see that I have some specification of, of the kind of machines that I want to boot up, but I want to boot those machines up into having some specific role, right? Sometimes I have, I have dev stack machines, you know, that I want to boot up and say, just boot up a machine that has dev stack fully installed. Uh, the machines that we're going to be looking at are, are the OpenStack controller machines. And what you can see here is the actual IP address that we're going to be assigning to those machines and also how much memory those machines are going to be using. So even for people who feel like they're resource constrained on their laptops, you may want to want to tune down the actual amount of memory that's being used by those machines a little bit. And I know for sure that nobody probably wants to run a, a Compute2 instance, for example. Because this is, co Compute2 instance is what I use to run Tempest. So it has tons of, of, of memory because Tempest doesn't always clean up all of its VMs as, it's run, as it runs, so, so it's good to have lots of things. And, and you can see, even for, for testing that I have of, of more specific roles, I have all these various machines that I bring up for testing. And, and the reality is that, that for each of those machines, and, and this is really the meat of Vagrant, is that we can specify you know, what, what actual starting disk image do we use to boot those machines. And, and here we can, you know, I'm, I'm basically doing CentOS or Precise64 right now. I know that eventually we'll add Debian. And I, because this is what I used to run all the actual continuous integration stuff for the Puppet modules is, is this exact script, and I'm running that right now both on Red Hat as well as, as or, or specifically, I think, CentOS 6.4, oh, sorry, CentOS 6.3, as well as, as Precise 64. So, so in, this in, in this machine, you can really see everything that I'm doing, in, including creating the various interfaces that each machine will have. And then the last thing that, that you see is that we're, we're basically running 
um, an app get update or a, or a yum, uh, whatever the cache update command is. And then the last thing we're doing is, is we're, we're integrating Vagrant with Puppet for a few different runs. Um, one of those runs is, is, is just to set up the base environment, and, and we'll look at this setup.host or uh, setup slash host.pp. And then we have another Puppet run, which is specifically based on the operating system name for operating system specific setups. And, and, and the main point of, of, the, of the OS specific setups is to essentially set up whatever Cloud Archive or, or Apple repositories we need to set up in order to be able to install the correct packages for OpenStack. And, and, and we'll look at those in a second. And, and the very last part of this is that we just do this this basic puppet apply run on, on, on the site manifest, and, and we'll, be, we'll be looking at, at, at each of these files in a second. So we're actually running puppet three times, one for, let's call it environment specific setup, one for um, package repository specific setup, and then the last runs are actually for installing these machines with the correct OpenStack roles. And that, that's, that's kind of the Vagrant file. And again, it's, it, it's for really specifying the information related to the virtual machines that I use for testing, and I, and, and I think that other people find useful as well for just being able to have a real simple way just to get up the exact same OpenStack environment that I use, the exact same OpenStack environment, which is what I use for testing as well. So, there's, so the question was, you, you see things for running apply, running agent, uh, there's two ways to run Puppet. One of them is called Puppet Apply, and you're assuming that the actual Puppet content is, is on your local machine, and you're just running Puppet against that content. With Puppet Apply, you're assuming there's a server somewhere. And I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into Swift now, but because of the multi-node orchestration stuff for Swift, it requires a Puppet Master, right? Because the machines need to, to place information about themselves in a central database that they can read from each other to understand how to build the ring for Swift. So the Puppet agent specific stuff, which requires a Puppet Master, is only required for Swift. And for Swift, it actually requires that you boot a, a Puppet Master, which is one of the roles specified in the Vagrant file. Yes, yes. So, so the question is, where does Vagrant sit in? And, and yes, it is analogous to, to, to bare metal. Right, but it's, it's more specifically about setting up virtual machines, creating virtual adapters, or, or sorry, virtual interfaces for those machines, and getting a base image on those machines. And then the next thing Vagrant does is, is call Puppet. So that, that Vagrant up command sets all that stuff up where the Vagrant file is all about specifying those virtual machines, which is analogous to, to bare metal provisioning, except we're also creating the hardware, right, not just installing the OS on it. And then running Puppet is, is the last thing that it does. So, so the next thing that I wanted to, 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 to kind of talk about is, is, is librarian puppet, uh, but more specifically, this concept of the puppet file, because uh, I, I have a feeling that librarian puppet will be deprecated eventually, but the file format that I'm going to show you is, is, is kind of what's interesting and, and, and important here, that in the same directory, if we just have a look at, at people's puppet file, and I encourage you to open it, you really see that, that this is exactly what I use. These are all the modules that I use. These are the external Git repositories where I'm retrieving those modules from. Most of the content that's OpenStack specific is coming off of StackForge. Um, there are a, a few things like, like Quantum, which is coming off of my Git repository, uh, but that will soon be moved to StackForge. And then there's a lot of things that are utilized, you know, rsync and, and xnet and MySQL and, and Git setup that aren't specific to OpenStack, and, and those things in general are, are just content that's puppet content for specifying that configuration that we're just getting from somewhere else, right? So, so this is kind of broken up into the puppet content that's OpenStack specific, uh, the puppet content that's, that's more generalized middleware in the middle, and then in the bottom, just various other components for things like configuring, you know, X on D and SSH. It's, it's compute one, vagrant up compute one. So it looks like someone has a controller that installed successfully. Who's installed a controller? What? Keep going. It's happening. Things are happening. 
this is gonna actually work? If only I, I wish I could like do a, a hill click now. It's gonna exit with zero. Yeah, it's gonna exit with zero. It'll, it's gonna, it's gonna do its thing until it's done. And you'll get your little shell prompt back. Sorry? No one's maintaining it right now. And it is, it is, it is a massive pain. Uh, but nobody's actively maintaining it right now. And I think, I think everyone is, is um, waiting for someone to, because given how, how useful this is as a utility, I think everyone's kind of waiting for someone to pick it up and do something with it. There's a couple projects out there. Um, R10K or something is one of them. Uh, also Henson is GitHub originally wrote Library and Puppet. Now they're working on something called Henson, which is, is maybe not in a, in a releasable state. I know last time I tried it, it was only 193, which I can't, I, I have to do things on 187. Compute one. And also, if you do a vagrant status, you can see all the machines that you can boot, but please just boot compute one. Please don't boot compute two. It uses 12 gigs of RAM. I, I'm, I'm going to get there. I mean, I'm going to explain all this stuff. So this is, so this is the next thing, is that, it, is that these are the files that I use. So, so a, a pretty reasonable setup would say to, to start here, you know, if you need to fork things, you can specify the things that are forked here. And, and the thing that I really like about Puppet File is it gives you almost this really nice to-do list to say, wow, you know, I have my upstream repository name here. It means that I've forked those things, right? right? These, are the, these are the actual places where I should be submitting these things back upstream. But it gives you a really easy way to specify that some of these things might be local if you have to fix things for your environment. And, and this is the file that actually, that, that's used to install all the content. And, and, and of course, everything was pre-populated on the actual um, puppet tarballs that I handed out. And, and that was just done by running Oh, does it? Yeah, it's 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 compute one. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's vagrant up compute one. So, sorry about that. I, I unfortunately wrote the README to, to help everyone, but but very fast and, and very late last night. So so if you run a vagrant status, you can see the names of the possible machines that you can boot. It's vagrant up compute one. And, 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 and you don't have to change the proxy. The, the proxy settings have, have, have all been hard-coded. So I'm going to move on to, so now we've seen the Vagrant file. We've seen the Puppet file, which, which specifies kind of all the content that will be populated into the modules directory. Because the main difference between the project, as you would find it online, and as we distributed, is that we pre-populated the modules directory. Which, when you go online to, to StackForge, it's not there. You need to run librarian puppet, target the Puppet file in order for that to happen. And, and, and again, just an example of the puppet file, just like I already showed everyone. And now we're gonna start to get a little bit into the things that are puppet specific. So, so the peripheral tooling around puppet is, you know, puppet file for knowing what content to install, the vagrant file for knowing how to specify the virtual machines to bring up as the base images that we're gonna install OpenStack on, and then looking in, in the site manifests, each of these site manifests are going to be run um, on the actual nodes in order to bring them into the proper state. And, and the site manifests are interesting because they, they perform different kinds of actions. Uh, you guys actually have a, a, a pre-manifest which is kind of added just for the purpose of this to make sure everything was going through the proxy. Uh, but specifically, if you look at, at the host manifest, it just does some, some very, very, very basic um, sp setup that's specific to the environment. Uh, one of those things is, is set up host entries for all those machines that use the same IP addresses that were specified in Vagrant. So this is now, now getting into, into actual Puppet, right? This is, this is Puppet specification for the entries that should exist in Etsy hosts is, is what we're looking at here. This is also doing, you know, setting up basic group on Puppet. It's also just laying down this simple file so that, um, 
if we're running Vagrant, the Vagrant provisioning, it does a lot more than just install OpenStack. It also throws this script down that we can run if we need to rerun. Um, this is Puppet syntax. This is Puppet. Yeah, Puppet it has its own language. That's what's being used to specify how to configure these, these individual roles. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Hira, but the actual Hira configuration data store lookup is, is also specified in this file. Um, Hira allows us to, to look up uh, data from external sources. And in this case, we have kind of all the common data that we can override that's in an external file we'll talk about. I have a specific Jenkins file that I use to override things for continuous integration and then specific node-specific configuration files so that individual nodes can also update data. We're gonna talk about Hira and we'll look at the Hira data store that comes with this project in, in just a second. The, also in this, in this manifest, and again, we're just looking inside of the manifest directory. This is where all of the kind of initially loaded code, you can think of, of these manifests like the main for your program. This is where Puppet starts processing to figure out how to configure things. So inside of this setup, we're specifically looking at the precise one, but there's also one specific for Red Hat that sets up Apple. And this is mainly just setting up things specific to configuration of the repositories for where we're gonna actually download the content. So this is setting up the, the cloud archive. In this case, the, the Red Hat one sets up Apple to the correct locations. Um, this is actually looking up data so you can externally specify the OpenStack version and, and you, you may also note that's doing a Hira lookup. So we're looking externally for data to tell us if we should be installing right now. Uh, you guys should be installing Grizzly, but you can also install Folsom just by updating that OpenStack underscore version variable in Hira. You can see the, the actual Hira lookup that it's doing for that right here. But this is doing basically just the setup. You know, we're setting up the proxy. Uh, in this case, this is targeting my local laptop, but you guys are targeting the, the, the lovely server that I have set up here. But the real meat of, of what's actually installing OpenStack, and, and it's worth knowing that, of course, you need to know what external repositories do I need to set up. Those things are happening in the, in the setup precise.64, uh, which is the second puppet apply that's run from the Vagrant file. And, and the last thing is the actual site manifest. And, and the first thing you see here is we're making a lot of external high recalls in order to retrieve the data that, that you would actually want to configure And then that information, for example, you can toggle between, if you guys were crazy enough, the, the, the quantum stuff's almost ready, but you can toggle between Nova Networks and, and Quantum, where, where Nova Networks assumes the uh, flat DHCP network. This is manifest site.pp. So, so inside of the manifest directory, you really see all, all the main configuration code. This is the code that's actually specifying the role. So if we look at, at node here, you see node openstack-controller. And this is actually the all the code that's being done for setting up the actual controller. Um, for the most part, there's a lot of Red Hat specific stuff, especially around setting up firewall rules that, that probably needs to be moved further down. Um, but, but for the most part, it should be, you know, for, for, for people who, who know Grizzly somewhat, there's one Grizzly specific line of, if it is Grizzly, then install Nova Conductor on the controller. You can see class Nova Conductor enabled true. Uh, but for the most part, it's just calling this single OpenStack controller class. And again, this is puppet syntax, and then specifying all the configuration required in order to configure this machine as the OpenStack controller, which is all being passed through this class. And classes in Puppet are an abstraction layer that you can use to specify configuration interfaces. And in this case, it's just simplified configuration interfaces for this is how we configure a controller, this is how we configure a compute, and someone had the question of, how realistically does this map to a, a production environment? And the further that we drill down, the more that it starts to map to what you would do in production. Like, like what I'm providing here is a simple framework that, that just works. And, and for those of you that are still having bandwidth issues, just trust me, it just works. Um, but, but in reality, what's important is to understand how to drill down so that you can re reach the correct abstraction layer that's flexible enough for your use case. And for some people, this may be the layer that, oh, there's this thing called OpenStack Controller, oh, there's this thing called OpenStack Compute, those are the things that I care about. We're gonna drill down a little bit into those configuration interfaces to show 
how they're actually just flexibly composed of a set of core modules that, that provide all of the possible OpenStack services. And, and again, the important things to note here is just that we have nodes, and, and in this case, node is, is specified based off the certificate names of those machines, and, and here it's that things whose name matches compute node should be installed as, as compute. There's some, some kind of QMU-specific logic up here, and, and some Red Hat-specific things, but, but for the most part, it's just setting up this, this OpenStack compute node and also setting up some, some volumes for, for, for sender as well in this example. But it's really just this kind of unified interface for this is the interface of how you configure OpenStack compute. What's the permission denied? Yeah, you may need to. You know, I would say for now, just you can just sudo bash and just switch to root, but before you run it. So if, if people are getting to the point of, of, of running that script, one thing that I would encourage you to do, sorry, I'm, I'm going to break because people are asking about that, is if you, if you open up the, the test underscore nova.sh script, um, you're going to see One thing that I would in, encourage you to do uh, this is like a half configured instance. Anyways. So one thing that I, that I would configure to do, if, if you look, the, the first call there's a wget. Um, if you could maybe install that image and, and not do the wget, I think we'll get saturation and people start downloading that, that Cirrus image. That Cirrus image is, is supplied on the Apache server. Uh, but you'll need to put it in one of the directories that's NFS mounted, uh, which is the modules directory or the hybrid data directory. Uh, I may have to say that again. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep on walking through this a little bit, and then we'll 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 come back around to that. But but we're definitely gonna be bandwidth constrained on on installing the Cirrus image. It is available online, but but you may have to modify that script slightly. So, so again, j just kind of at a, at a high level, um, I, I, I showed those code examples from what, what we call in puppet language the site manifest. Site manifest you can think of in, in programming terms as being like the main. This is where Puppet's going to start executing when it tries to configure out configure the actual role of machines. And, and specifically, it's this syntax of node blocks that's used in order to say four nodes who have been identified like this you know, these are the rules, or, or, or this is the specification of how those nodes should be configured. Where in the example of our site manifest for this project, we saw that that was typically by the classes OpenStack Controller and, and OpenStack Compute. So, so the next thing that I want to talk about is Hira, and, and Hira is embedded in the site manifest, and it's actually, that's how we're resolving all the data, is, is through Hira. So HIRA stands for, or, or it's short for, a, a, an external hierarchical data lookup system. And what this means is that often data needs to come from some external source, and, and there are certain factors that determine what that data actually is. And as an example for how we're using HIRA in, in this environment, you have kind of common data, which is all the defaults for things which you can adjust in an external config file, I have a specific HIRA file that I can insert from continuous integration runs in order to update things like, you know, like, like Jenkins may want to set what network mode are we running, what version of OpenStack are we testing, and I have, I have various build matrices that are modifying the data in, in that CI layer, which then overrides data from the comment section, and, and then finally we have node-specific data. A, a more general use case is that maybe we would have defaults Maybe we would have data that, that is specific to what country our, our controller lives in, maybe specific to what region or what zone. So you can build this override hierarchy so you can edit individual files and, and know that that's going to have precedence over some other file. And if we go back to, in this case, I'm going to the host setup, we can see 
then I'm actually configuring this, this hira.yaml configuration file, which is where I specify wh what the lookup precedence is. In this case that we have some common, which is over overridden by a configuration file called Jenkins, which is then overridden by configuration files per hostname. And if we want to look at those configuration files, they're all in this Hira data directory of the project. So if we CD into this Hira data directory, you'll see a couple things. One of those is there's a common directory, and then there's these specific Swift Storage 1, Swift Storage 2, Swift Storage 3. So if we look inside of that common directory, we just see that we have all this externalized data that we can set. And it's things like, you know, what are my database passwords for, for the MySQL database that we're configuring? You know, what's all of the various keystone settings for the service users that this creates for keystone? You know, how, what are the settings for connecting to Rabbit? And then a bunch of, of, of Swift specific stuff as well. The, the knob related to this that, that I wind up configuring the most is, is, is one switching between Nova Network or, or Quantum Network. The quantum stuff's not 100% perfect, but if you want to try, see where we're at with quantum, just you know, change network type from Nova, which is what it sets you now to quantum, and then you can try to, to, to build out a, a, a quantum environment just by changing this external configuration file. So we also have, can have configuration files per node, and for pe people who understand Swift pretty well, it makes sense that nodes may want to override What's the actual zone that they live in for Swift? So we can see for those nodes that, you know, Swift Storage 1, Swift Storage 2, and Swift Storage 3 are just overriding their zone, which is specific to their node. And that's, that's living external to the actual puppet code in this configuration data. So again, we're just in this Hira data store of that Hira data directory of that project. We're looking at the YAML files. And, and the last thing that I have right here is I have this simple jenkins.yaml, where for example, for my matrices, the Jenkins job does things like this, right? So I just have, and, and, and that will now override things that are specified in the common.yaml directory, but again, this would be overridden by things that are node specific. So I just have this simple three layer, layer external data hierarchy where I can specify the data that's really driving the configuration of all of this stuff. Any, any questions about Hira before? Yeah, it's just an external data hierarchy. Yes? Sorry? So if we go to, if we look at the, at the site manifest, which is driving the main configuration, if we go to the very top of the site manifest, you see lots of calls that look like this. Right? In the context of the thing that's really driving the configuration, we're making external calls to Hira, where Hira is now resolving that, the value of that data through that external hierarchical lookup. Um, so this, again, is in the site manifest. So previous to Puppet 3.0, we need to make these external Hira calls. But once you start looking at Puppet 3.0 or sooner, Hira is automatically embedded and, and automatically called from all class parameters. So all class parameters can automatically be overridden by external data stores. That's a Puppet 3.0 issue. But right now, I'm actually supporting Puppet all the way back to 2.6 to, to, to 3.1 with these modules. 2.6 because of, of Red Hat. Yes. Hira is, is totally configurable, the, the default um, for Hira, so Hira has what's called backends, and the default backend is YAML. You can have multiple backends, so, so you could have a Puppet backend, a YAML backend, and specify those things as part of the same hierarchy. Um, there are JSON backends, there are also SQL backends that exist, there are NoSQL database backends that exist. So it is, it is pretty easy to configure the Hira backends, and I think that these days, even in, in the Puppet training class, we're teaching people, or in the Puppet developer class, we're teaching people how to create custom backends. And I know that, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the NoSQL backend, right, because you get an automatic programmatic API that you can use to set these data hierarchies. And I think there's, there's a, a, 
uh, something called, I think it's HTTP, I forgot. But there's, there's a backend out there by, by Crayfish X. So if you search Hira Crayfish X, um, he has, has backends for, for, I think, CouchDB and, and, and at least for one other NoSQL database. Yes, another question? Absolutely. And I think that, that if you were deploying multiple clouds, your, your Hira data lookup might look something like this, where I have different data stores that indicate you know, what the addresses of services are. It's, it's possible to do kind of automated lookup of, of things with Puppet, but I, I would probably start with hard coding addresses. And then once you get into things like Puppet DB, you could start to say, you know, anything that you know, is, has a certain subnet should connect to a certain master or, or, or to a certain controller. So if you were deploying multiple clouds, then this is really what you would do is you would specify the data that's different between those OpenStack instances and those data centers in Hira. So in, in this example, those are, are going into the default or, or into the actual common Hira lookup. So, so, so the precedence here is lowest precedence is at the top, highest precedence is at the bottom. So that the defaults in this example are all in common or default from the top, and then you might have, let's say, data center specific overrides and then node specific overrides would always win. So, 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 so that question about, is this how I would deploy OpenStack across multiple data centers across multiple countries? Yes. This is the easiest way to do that, is, is using this hierarchical data lookup. So we, we already looked at, at, at kind of what exists in, in my hierarchy, which is pretty small, mainly because I just use it for, for continuous integration. So just to drill down a little bit more, you know, we've looked at the Vagrant file that I'm using primarily for testing purposes in order to create the, get the OSs up and going. Uh, we looked at, at the site manifests that I'm using for various site manifests for environment specific things, for setting up the external repositories, and for configuring OpenStack. Now we're gonna look, we're gonna finish the time talking about the components that are actually used to configure out OpenStack. So, ah, now we have pretty colors. So these are more or less the, we'll call them the, the very high level, but also constrained configuration interfaces that are possible through the OpenStack module. And when I say module, if you want to find the actual source code for these things, you should CD into modules. And then you're going to see a directory called, surprisingly enough, OpenStack. So if you just CD into modules slash OpenStack, then you can see that we have these things defined. We have things for all-in-one installations, for the simple case of just splitting out compute for controller, uh, for, for setting up kind of all of the possible databases um, that, that need to be set up on a central MySQL server, and also for setting up all of the required Keystone endpoints as well. So, so and, and OpenStack in general tends to do it for everything. So if we look at OpenStack Keystone, that's gonna set up Keystone endpoints for all the related services, Glance and Nova and, and Swift and, and Keystone even needs its own endpoint. And these are the things that we're actually calling from those site manifests. So if we look at something like OpenStack All, you know, we declare this thing as a class, we specify all these parameters where, where the actual variables that we're referring to here may be variables that themselves are resolved through Hira. These could be direct Hira calls when we actually um, declare this configuration interface that we use to convert machines into functional OpenStack all-in-one instances. And just to kind of go from the source code into there, again, I'm just changing my directory to modules. And actually, we can see the modules that were installed via library and puppet here, just in the modules directory. In this case, we're talking about the OpenStack module and for that module, the actual content is stored inside of the manifest directory of that module. So we can pretty basically see all the kind of things that, that are specific to this constrained way to deploy OpenStack. So, you know, you can see the all-in-ones. I think that the center-specific stuff doesn't quite work. Um, let's, let's drill in something that's, that's fair, fairly obvious, like Keystone.
So this is the other end of things, right? Previously, we've seen examples of how we declare a class, and that's how we specify specific configuration interface that feeds into a class. Additionally, the, the class has to be defined. So here's an example of, of this will set up a keystone server with all the endpoints that you need for all of your services. And this has a bit of, of conditional logic just to, to set things as defaults, but the gist of it is that we're actually building out a, a keystone server, and then when things are enabled, we're, we're building out the administrative and the, and the member roles for keystone. And then for each of the services, we have configuration that we can specify in, in the interface to say, should we actually set up the, the keystone endpoints and, and authorize users for these various services? And, and, and I mean, for, for people who have familiarity with, with Keystone endpoints, it's really the things you would expect to see, right? That we have a password, we have, you know, a public admin, an internal URL, and also region. You know, you, you can also override what is the tenant. But again, when we're looking at OpenStack, we're looking at a, at a very constrained view. So in this case, we're just assuming the uh, default tenant of, of services. I, I believe it is. So just to look at, at one more example here, if we look at an example of a Nova controller, you know, ag again, it has a lot of specific configuration, but it actually deploys something called Nova, which Nova is kind of all the configuration that's shared by all the Nova components. It's deploying something called a Nova API service, and then it has conditional logic for, you know, if quantum was set to false, then, then we deploy something called a Nova network. Otherwise, we're deploying something called a, a, a quantum server, a, a quantum OVS plugin, a quantum OVS agent, a DHCP agent, an L3 agent. And then some, some various other services get deployed on, on this constrained view of a Nova controller, including a scheduler, an, an object store, a cert, and a, and a, and a console auth. And, and also, if we're enabling VNC, also a, a VNC proxy. And I think this is a pretty good view of, of Again, these OpenStack modules themselves are a real constrained way of doing things, but they themselves rely on, on these individual configurable components that are, are very, very, very flexible. So, so again, to answer the question of, of how do we do this in production, one of those ways is if you're happy with OpenStack, start with OpenStack classes. But if you're not, have a look inside here and use that as examples of how you would want to configure out your own OpenStack services, right? So, so for some people, they're, they're happy to use these. For other folks, they actually need to kind of crack these things open and use them as an example of how they would build their more customized versions of, of OpenStack. Any questions about the OpenStack module before we, we drill down and, and talk about more of the, of the core modules? Yeah, so, so when we think about the OpenStack module, it's presenting a more constrained way of doing things. And so, so for the example of Keystone, th think of OpenStack as being related to all the modules. So from the perspective of, of Keystone, if I'm thinking about Nova, that means I need a Nova endpoint and a Nova user and a Nova role and, and a Nova service. But if we're thinking about Keystone from the perspective of OpenStack, I need endpoints for Nova, for Glance, for Keystone, for Swift, right? But those things rely on the individual components from the other modules. And, and, and that's, those are the two main purposes of the OpenStack module. One is to have this view of OpenStack as a, and utilize individual components from the core modules. The other is to have this very constrained way of installing OpenStack just for simplicity. Right, that all I want to do is, is an all-in-one installation, or all I want to do is a, a controller with compute nodes. Yes, um, yes, there's a center module. Mm -hmm. Then I think that... Um, I'd, I'd have to actually look at the center module. So the question is, like, how flexible is the center stuff? 
And, and the reality is that it's as flexible as the community around the Puppet modules have made it. So if we look at, at the sender module, then in this example, I'm seeing in the volume directory, I see that right now the things that are supported are NetApp and iSCSI. I know for a fact that there are patches for Nexenta. And it, those are the things that people that are using these modules have added. So if there's something not there, you would want to look at the center module and say, how's it laid out? Okay, so there's something called a volume directory. That's where the volume extensions are going. And then add your own extension there using the other ones as an example. And, and content that is like add this new plugin is, it, is pretty easy to merge. We're, we're a lot more critical on things that are touching existing components because they may break backwards compatibility. But for things adding new components, we're pretty, pretty okay with just merging things in and saying, okay, we, we trust the person that, that added this plugin knows what they're doing. But these are the plugins we currently support it, and that's just because that's what people using this module are using is NetApp and the iSCSI and Nexenta, which is coming soon. So this is kind of kind of drilling down to, to the core modules. And for the core modules, it's things like Nova, Swift, Glance, Keystone, Horizon, OpenStack. OpenStack we talked about, that probably shouldn't be in this list. And Cinder, each of those things have their own modules which have specified all of the various services that can be configured as a part of that component of OpenStack. Um, I have Quantum and, and Solometer kind of bold, in, in bold here because those things, so the modules live on StackForge. Who, who knows what StackForge is? Well, just a few people. So StackForge is, is the OpenStack infra team is creating kind of a, a, we'll call it continuous integration as a service platform for OpenStack um, that you know, uses the Garrett system, uses the same coding processes as the other projects, and, and has some gating capabilities. All the modules live there, or all the modules are migrating there, except Quantum and Solometer aren't there yet, but they're, they're kind of coming soon. But again, if we look at the Puppet file, which I talked about around Librarian Puppet, you can see which things are on StackForge, which things are pointing to my, my uh, modules on, on, on GitHub, for example. Um, right now, Quantum, in, in the next couple of days, will be pushing to StackForge. Solometer, right now, everyone's using the one from Innovance. Um, so it just Innovance is Solometer on, on GitHub. Uh, the Innovance module will be the one that moves to StackForge. And, and just to drill down in here, for people who have some familiarity with OpenStack, I think that, that the thing to note is just, just how flexible these, these individual components are. And in this example, I'll just do a quick PWD here, m most specifically to show that we're in the Nova directory of the modules directory. So we're actually looking at the Nova module here, and you can see that it has just tons of, of, of configuration for the individual components, right? And, and, and the reason for that is that the, the configuration at this level really thinks about what are the services and, and what are the configuration abstractions that exist. So for people who have more complicated use cases of how they want to deploy OpenStack, they can use the OpenStack modules as an example of how to compose these things out into the individual roles. And just to take some of them, most of them are, are pretty easy. I mean, if we look at example at, at the Nova, conductor module, it just uses this Nova generic service, which just sets up a service, um, sets up the actual package. One of the interesting things here is that params, um, all of the things that are, that are specific based on what operating system we're, we're using and supporting, all this data is split up in the params file. So you can see that the main difference most of the differences between operating systems have to do with the fact that packages just all have different names and you know, different packages are supported for different things in the components. All that stuff is, is, is kind of ab abstracted away and, and you'll see that these params classes do exist for, for all the modules. And, and really the last thing is just to talk about that, you know, all these modules themselves rely on, on, on just a ton of other core modules that are, that are useful for configuring all the baseline components of OpenStack, but they're also generally useful as well for even configuring virtual machine instances onto OpenStack. And a lot of these modules 
grew up out of the OpenStack group of, of modules, but have really gained legs on their own, that, that people are, are using these modules outside of OpenStack, just to configure you know, RabbitMQ for some other reason, or, or, or MySQL um, for some other reason. Uh, Apache is kind of a, we use, and a lot of these are, are just general purpose modules that, that we use, which are the same things that are used by the Puppet community. Um, all these modules you can find on, on, on Puppet Labs Forge, which I'd, I'd like to show a link to. I don't, I don't know why I typed it there. I think I'm just so in shock that. This is the example of the, of the Puppet Forge. You can see there's you know, over 1,000 Puppet modules there. Uh, the, the more stable release version of all the OpenStack modules can be found on the Forge, uh, but the Grizzly modules just aren't on the Forge yet. It, it'll be in the next couple of weeks. R right now, the stuff on the Forge is fulsome. Uh, the Grizzly modules are, are, are working. They're, they're functional. Um, the, the lab we did today, if people want to take that home and, and, and finish some of it, does use the Grizz Grizzly modules, uh, but they just haven't been pushed to the Forge yet. This is, this is generally where the more stable releases of, of the modules are. There's even a stack tech module up there. And, and even just a simple search of OpenStack shows the, all the modules that are on the Forge that are, that are OpenStack related. Yeah, Librarian Puppet supports both the ability to download content from the Forge as well as the ability to get content directly from GitHub. So the last thing that I want to talk about is, is maybe just a little bit around the move to StackForge for these modules. Just curious, who actually finished? Who has, who has functional OpenStack stuff? That is not bad. You guys are rocking. Especially, thanks for my, my helpers for that. That's, that's, and, and I think for, 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 for people who don't, um, you know, um, I, can, I can maybe clean up that readme a little bit and make sure it's, it's, it's fixed. You know, the main difference when, when you take this thing and, and go and do it at home is that you're going to need, need to change the proxy to probably use like a local squid proxy or just eliminate the proxy configuration altogether. Huh? Oh, sorry, the credentials for Horizon. Yay, people are making it to Horizon. It's admin, and the password is change me, capital C, capital M. But again, if we want to know where the, Horizon, where, the, where the credentials we can use to sign into Horizon are, where can we find them in the code? But where does that point to? Hira, they're in the Hira data stores. But yeah, so, so all the credentials, all the passwords, all the information that's data related is, is going to be in that Hira data store. Sorry? So, so, so the question is, that's great, you showed us a single compute, but reality is we want multiple computes with a single controller. So for that use case, so if we look at the, at the site manifest, and sorry, I, I know I go way too fast, but if we actually look at this site manifest, which is at the root directory manifest site.pp, inside of that module, the important component from the site manifest are the actual node definitions. And we'll see two node definitions. One is a node definition for OpenStack controller. The other one is the node definition for compute. And the thing to notice about these node definitions are these super cool like forward slash lines. What does that usually mean when something is, is, is enclosed in, in super cool slanted lines? It's a regular expression. So, and this regular expression maps to the identifier for machines, which by default is host name, but actually can be configured with dash dash cert name from the command line. So any machine who, who targets this site manifest um, and has a cert name that matches compute will itself become a, a, a Nova compute instance and will be configured to talk to the same control node because it's going to be doing the same Hira lookups to get the same data values. So you just specify another one, specify dash dash cert name, 
in this example of the vagrant specific environment, there are two compute nodes. But please be warned, the second compute node I use for Tempest testing, and it has 12 gigs of RAM. So you may want to go into the vagrant file and lower the RAM for compute to a little bit because it uses tons of RAM. But it has to for, for, for Tempest. Maybe, it, it, maybe for the Folsom Tempest, but well, we'll see if, if I need so much RAM for, for Tempest going forward. So again, it's a regular expression. Any identifiers that map compute will become compute nodes. You can spin up multiples. Sorry? Oh, it's on StackForge. So StackForge slash puppet dash. That's actually a, 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 a good question. For, for people who want to look at these things, if we go to GitHub dash StackForge. Sorry? Uh, I would guess Monty, but it was either Monty or Mordred or, or someone who works for him. It is, it is, it does not mean that these are incubated, but it is, it is, um, OpenStack Infra team has what I would call continuous integration as a service. And this is the platform for that continuous integration as a service. These modules are leveraging OpenStack's infrastructure for continuous integration. Like I said, Monty and his team has built a, a, a pretty interesting continuous integration as a service tool, which is all based on StackForge. So this means that the modules follow the same development practices. They have ticketing system and launch pad. The, the code sits in Garrett. This is actually a mirror from the review.openstack.org, from, from the Garrett system, or sorry, Garrett.openstack.org. This is actually a mirror from that. But the code actually lives and breathes and, and accepts patches from Garrett. So that's in, in, in Hira. So the question is, where can you specify version? In Hira, you can specify it in one of two places. Common is, is probably going to be the easiest. And if you look in your common, just specify an OpenStack version. And this accepts Folsom, or it accepts Grizzly at the moment. By default, it's Nova Networks. I think that, that assuming Quantum by default is, I don't think it's there yet. <laughs> um, but right now, the, the, the Quantum stuff isn't perfect, but it's getting better and better and better every day. There is this variable called network type. Like for example, on my laptop, I'm doing all Quantum testing right now. But right now, you guys deployed Nova Network, so network type was set to Nova. If you wanna see the latest status of the work in, in Quantum, change that to quantum. Quantum only works on Ubuntu right now. Um, it'll be working with Red Hat uh, probably next week. Quantum will work with Red Hat. So, so two things. Um, the latest version of the code is always going to be on StackForge. But if you want to follow the project, review.openstack.org and each of these are, are, are separate projects. So for example, if you want to see what patches ha have been submitted, like what things are approved, what things have failed unit tests, are, are, are people pretty familiar with this view of the OpenStack development stuff? So like these are all of the open patches, and there's, th there's a lot of open patches because we're all here this week. Uh, but you can see that each of these has projects. All the projects are under StackForge. For example, StackForge slash puppet dash keystone. So this is really where the code lives and breathes, and you can see you know, all the patches that are submitted right now. Um, a lot of these patches are, 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 are targeting Havana, and within a week or so, the modules will be, will be targeting Havana, and we'll be just, just backporting critical bug fixes for the, for, for the Grizzly stuff. Uh, but right now, right now we, we, we haven't actually cut the Grizzly branches yet, which is gonna be happening soon, because everything, everything works for, for Grizzly at the moment. I'm sorry? Sure. Yeah, I mean, 
So, so for my purposes, the, the, the stuff that I demonstrated today is, is what I use for continuous integration. Um, I prefer to not use a server for CI purposes just because it's an extra machine that I have to spin up that you know, causes me extra cycles for, for individual test runs. For the Swift stuff, I actually, the, the Swift stuff only works for the Puppet Master. But for the non-Swift components, because in Swift, you have, I have to do all this dynamic data lookup for, uh, to understand how to build the ring. But for the Nova stuff, it can run either Puppet Master or, or Puppet Agent. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't really have, so there's stuff out there for bare metal. Um, but, you know, most of the examples you're going to find are, are cobbler-based. Like Cisco Systems, I think Cybera has something cobbler-based. There's a lot of, of cobbler-based bare metal stuff out there, but it's not directly associated with the project. I'm kind of, the, the project assumes, like, figure out how to get the OS there and then start. So all of the OpenStack stuff from Puppet Lab, on Puppet Lab's GitHub is being deprecated. So StackForge, all that stuff has been moved here, right? Because we were kind of doing the like GitHub workflow. So the question is, what should we use? And, and, and the answer is this, and then this stuff gets cloned to StackForge. All the stuff under Puppet Lab's namespace is going to be deprecated. StackForge will still be speeding into the module forge for stable releases. Uh, but the Puppet Lab's GitHub stuff is deprecated. And the, the rationale for that is we wanted to, these things to live as close as possible to OpenStack and to follow the development process of OpenStack, right? Because, you know, best case scenario, we can get more OpenStack core contributors working on this stuff, you know, but another advantage is it sure would be nice to have the operators who are working on the operation deployment tools learn the actual practices for getting code submitted to OpenStack, right? As, as a ramp on process, we can get more operators contributing. A any other questions? So if you get this thing just from, so that, that's a great question. The, the, the question is, okay, you've given us a slightly modified version because we're, we're, we're proxying off your server. What should I use for real? If, if I want to recreate this thing, and if you just get this stuff off StackForge, then it assumes you've installed a squid proxy on your Mac. So if you install your own local squid proxy on your Mac, and then just grab this stuff from StackForge, it'll work. And the readme does explain what those requirements are. But it's, it's, all, it's all been designed assuming a local running squid proxy. And if you don't want a proxy, if, if you actually do want to make connections to the outside world, which... It's, I don't know if I recommend because it, it, it makes things way slower if you're going to do it more than once. Um, then you want to look at the site manifests and specifically things in the setup directory. Like if you go to the manifest setup directory, the, in those files, that's where the various proxies are being configured. And if you just remove that code, it'll do direct connects through the NATed network on, on, on VBox. That's not true. The proxy configuration is totally decoupled from the image. So the image itself doesn't assume any proxy. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I just said. Yes, you need to remove, if, if, you're not, if you don't want to use a proxy, you need to remove stuff like this. And, and specifically, the only things you have to modify are in the manifest setup directory. Like, look for things that say proxy and comment them out if you, want, if you don't want to use a proxy. Yes, if you're going to be doing stuff like this on your laptop, you should use a proxy. That's why there's a default, right? Because it, yeah, it, that's a lot of, 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 of network. But I would definitely recommend using a proxy if for some reason you don't want to start with a proxy. Comment stuff out. But honestly, it's going to be just easier. Just install a squid proxy. It assumes like, like on its local 117.16.0.1 network that port 3128 is going to be running the proxy.
So I think I think eight's fine. I mean, honestly, I run, I have 500 gigs of SSD with 16 gigs of RAM, um, but but no, no, no. I, I can spin up about six or seven boxes before it falls over. And I was previously had no SSD with eight gigs of RAM, and it was like four boxes or five boxes when it starts to fall over. Uh, the main memory consumption, you know, I would want at least, I like a, a, a gig on the controller, because especially, like, you miss a lot of messages on RabbitMQ if, if you don't have enough memory. You get a lot of, like, like missed connections on RabbitMQ without enough memory. Um, for the compute host, it really depends how big the image is that you're using for testing. If you look at my stuff, it's using a, a, a Cirrus image uh, in Tiny. Um, Tiny is still 500 gigs of RAM. Or sorry, 500 gigs. 500 megs of RAM, even for the Tiny images in OpenStack. So either create your own custom flavors, which I don't know how supported that is in the, in the APIs. I know you can do it from the command line. So either create your own like Tiny flavors or assume you know a, a gig and a half to two gigs so you can spin up a couple VMs on the computos. But for, for, for a basic three node environment with eight gigs, you should be fine. And, and, any other questions? I don't know, 20 gigs, nothing. <laughs> it's not that much. It's, memory is, is, is a way bigger requirement than disk. This stuff just doesn't take up that much disk. The main, the main disk consumption, I mean, my CI boxes you know, churn through tons of disks because it's creating it over and over and over and over and over again and installing all the components. But I think the whole thing, how big is the, is the precise base box? 300. So the whole thing is probably, I don't know, I mean, 10 gig? I mean, it's, it, it, it just doesn't require that much disk. Yeah, memory. It requires memory. I don't know. Honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm watching all that stuff, but someone has already said, why aren't you using heat? Uh, because this works, and heat is, you know, some circles and arrows on a board. Um, yeah. but, but honestly, if someone wants to show me how to do this in heat, and it works today, and I can do it in a few hours, I'm, I'm down. You know, if, if someone wants to show me how to do this with triple O and heat, I'm down. I would guess that I, I, I'm probably better if you show me in a year. Or, or in six months. <laughs> I mean, I don't really follow the chef stuff very, very much. You know, it's similar. It's, it's, you know, it has a, a fundamentally different configuration model. Um, but in terms of what support do they have for OpenStack, no idea. They're, you should ask them. <laughs> they, they'll probably tell you something. Um, other questions? Yeah, so if you look at Stackforge, <laughs> Puppet OpenStack DevM, and, and you should probably, the, the, the main requirement for this is, is going to be a, a, a squid proxy running on your local machine in order to get it done. Well, some, how, how about something on, on port 3128 <laughs> that they can do some kind of proxying? Yes? The answer is that it, it kind of depends when you interrupt it. But if it's done with the, like building the box and setting up the network interfaces, you can run Vagrant Provision just to do the Puppet stuff. So Vagrant Provision name will do the Puppet stuff. So it looks like I'm totally out of time. Thank you, everyone.